the silence artist. He began to speak less and less, and in his poems he used fewer words than before, his silence growing, the pages he wrote becoming emptier. At his readings he would open the book and say, The Pair, and then lapse into silence, the audience waiting for the next word, becoming restless, shifting in their chairs as the poem sailed on like a skier who has just made a jump, the phrase coasting through the quiet until he added, On the plate and his audience came to rest, their hearing landed at last in the solidity of a finished thought. So it went, his voice trailing away, his books filling with silences like heaps of blown snow. As time went on, this slow drift of nothingness became a blizzard. In conversation he said very little, and his books were sparse, their few words like stones placed in a Zen garden. In Chicago, he gave a reading of 12 words. In Los Angeles, he read five. Finally, in New York, he gave a two-hour reading that consisted only of the words gentle and rhubarb. Some thought it was a joke, an elaborate gag that he would soon bring to an end with a speech that made fools of everyone. Others thought it was a profound and heartfelt statement only deepened by repetition. The inevitable happened during a radio interview when he answered the question, so where do you get your ideas? By saying nothing at all. From then on, he no longer spoke and his readings were events consisting only of silence, absences in which the audience sat transfixed, attentive, rituals in which a hundred people sat breathing in a lighted room. Was it the being together that was important? Was it the joy of listening with others, as though part of a flock of birds migrating in response to some unspoken instinct? The media went on, the hustle and crush of magazines, the blare of talk shows and newspapers and websites. Still he said nothing, and in his last years he gave hundreds of readings in which large crowds assembled only to listen to their own breathing, to the occasional cough or sneeze, to the hum of fluorescent lights. It seemed we had never listened this way before, never been quiet enough to hear the rustle of a distant tree in the wind, the flick of a lizard's tail, even the dried and lifted waters of the lake slowly gathering into cloud. When he died, his admirers said that now his poems were everywhere, that they could hear them in the streets, in the fields, and even in the rooms of busy restaurants. They said his work would last forever, that it had become part of eternity. And it was true that to many people it seemed he was still present, on stage somewhere in a forgotten town, reading a poem that had no end, the blank book open on the podium, the audience listening quietly, the author saying nothing at all.